Level zero, the ocean is calm, not flat, but alive in its usual rhythm. Waves crash on shorelines, tides rise and fall, a seagull circles overhead, a crab disappears beneath wet sand, and somewhere deep below, two tectonic plates press quietly against each other. This is level zero, the world before the wave. It looks peaceful, but it isn't empty. Pressure builds slowly, invisibly. Sediments shift, strain accumulates, fault lines lock. You won't feel it, you won't hear it, but the seabed remembers. At this level, there is no tsunami, not yet, but the setup is underway. It's tectonic tension, the first page of every tsunami story. Level one, the rupture happens. Two slabs of earth suddenly slip. It takes less than 20 seconds, but releases more energy than a nuclear bomb. The ocean above reacts instantly. A column of water miles wide is displaced upward. But out at sea, you wouldn't notice. The wave might only be 30 centimeters high, barely more than a ripple. It doesn't crash. It doesn't foam. It travels silently, at jet speed, over 800 kilometers per hour. That's level one. A tsunami has technically formed, but it hasn't become dangerous yet. Not out there. Ships at sea pass over it without concern. The water's surface merely lifts, then falls again. But don't be fooled, this isn't the wave. This is its shadow, and it's coming. The Boxing Day tsunami of 2004 began like this. An earthquake beneath the Indian Ocean, magnitude 9.1. No walls of water at first, just sensors blinking. Just the silence before the stories. Level 2. The ocean starts to speak. You're standing on the beach. And the water retreats. This isn't a tide. It's a red flag. The shoreline empties. Fish flop on sand. Boats lean on their sides. Children run forward, confused. But locals know. This is the inhale. What follows is the strike. The wave approaches. It may only be one to two meters high, but this isn't a normal wave. It doesn't curl and crash. It surges, like a slow, unstoppable wall of grey. And it doesn't stop at the beach. It pushes inland, hundreds of meters in some places. Fences buckle, cars float, ground floors flood in minutes. If it hits a low-lying coast, water can reach waist height inside homes. You don't drown in open water. You drown in your living room. Still survivable, still escapable, if you know it's coming. But it's enough to destroy. In 1992, Nicaragua was hit by such a tsunami. An undersea quake triggered waves about one meter high, but they surged 1.5 kilometers inland in some areas. More than 170 people died. Not because the wave was massive, but because no one expected it. This level is deceptive. Low height doesn't mean low risk. It's not the height that kills. It's the speed, the volume, the reach. Level 3. This is where destruction becomes inevitable. Waves now reach three to five meters in height. That's up to a two-story building. They strike like liquid bulldozers. Not once, but in waves. Three, four, five surges, minutes apart. Each one is worse than the last. The sea doesn't just enter the city, it tears it apart. Roads vanish, power lines snap, houses made of wood are splintered and lifted like toys. You think you can outrun it, but the water races forward faster than you can sprint. And when it catches you, it doesn't just knock you down, it takes you. This is where infrastructure begins to fail. Emergency services can't reach you, evacuation routes are blocked, phone lines die. In 2018, the Sunda Strait tsunami in Indonesia reached this level. Triggered by a volcanic eruption, the wave didn't even come with an earthquake warning. It struck coastal villages with waves three to five meters high. Over 430 people were killed. Thousands were injured. There was no time. Level 3 isn't the biggest wave, but it's big enough to end neighborhoods and fast enough to erase time to react. Level 4. This is the beginning of catastrophe. Now the wave is 6 to 10 meters high. A full-grown tree. A two-story bus. If you're on the beach, it's already too late. If you're in a building, it depends which floor. If you're in a car, it won't float. It will tumble. The water is not clear or blue. It's black, full of debris. Steel beams, broken glass, mud. It's not just a wave. It's a mobile demolition zone. And it's not done after the first strike. The first surge weakens defenses. The second rips open what's left. The third drags everything back out to sea. People, animals, 
vehicles. The death toll rises not just from drowning, but from impact. Floating cars collide with collapsed homes. Wooden beams impale walls. The sea becomes weaponized. In 2011, Japan saw this with harrowing clarity. The Tohoku earthquake triggered a tsunami over 10 meters tall in some areas. It overtopped 40-foot seawalls. It swept away entire towns. Over 18,000 people died. Even in one of the most prepared nations on Earth, it wasn't enough. At level 4, nothing is safe near the coast. Airports are shut down. Nuclear plants go into emergency mode. And the word recovery begins to mean years, not days. This is the threshold between destruction and devastation. Not every tsunami reaches this level, but the ones that do rewrite coastlines. Literally, entire rivers reverse. Bays are recarved. Sandbars disappear. What used to be a street is now part of the ocean. Forever. Level 5. Level 5 is where tsunamis stop being regional threats and start becoming city killers. At this level, the wave height reaches 6 to 10 meters, taller than a telephone pole, high enough to crush single-story buildings like toys. But it's not just height that matters now. It's volume. It's speed. It's the density of debris traveling inside the wave. Trees, cars, twisted rebar, moving at highway speeds. And it's the way the water behaves after impact, not just slamming into the shore, but surging inland like an invading army. In 1998, the northern coast of Papua New Guinea became a grim case study. A relatively modest offshore earthquake, magnitude 7.0, wasn't expected to cause much damage. But it triggered an underwater landslide, and that set off a tsunami that struck with terrifying focus. Waves between 10 and 15 meters tore into coastal villages, sweeping away entire communities. Over 2,000 people were killed, many of them within minutes. It wasn't just a wave, it was a sudden, coordinated collapse of life as it was known. Level 6. Level 6 isn't a natural disaster, it's a planetary statement. Here, waves reach 10 to 20 meters, and their power grows exponentially. A 20-meter wave doesn't just flood a village, it erases a coastline. At this scale, entire neighborhoods become part of the ocean. Concrete buildings crumble, ships get pushed far inland, rescue becomes nearly impossible, not because the people aren't trying, but because there's simply nothing left to reach. The 2010 Chile tsunami comes terrifyingly close to this level. Triggered by an 8.8 .8 magnitude quake, the sixth most powerful earthquake ever recorded, it sent waves racing across the Pacific. Coastal cities in Chile were slammed with water up to 15 meters high, and even distant nations like Japan, New Zealand, and the US West Coast saw warning sirens blare. This level changes everything. Entire towns are rebuilt, maps are redrawn, and governments reconsider what safe means. Level 7 is where imagination falters. We don't just measure the wave height here, we measure time by before and after. This is the rarest tier we've ever directly experienced. At this scale, waves tower above 20 meters, but more importantly, they're fast, sustained, and impossibly wide. It's not one wave, it's a train of them, a full sequence, each more chaotic than the last. And with every minute that passes, the disaster deepens. Tsunamis at level 7 don't just strike a country, they rewrite a coastline. And if you're looking for a real-world example, there's only one that fits without question. The Indian Ocean Tsunami of 2004. December 26th. A morning that started in silence ended with the sound of entire nations in mourning. A 9.1 to 9.3 magnitude earthquake ruptured a fault over 1,600 kilometers long, roughly the distance from New York to Miami. The seafloor heaved upward, displacing cubic kilometers of water and sending waves in all directions. It was one of the deadliest natural disasters in human history. In Banda Aceh, Indonesia, the first wave was already over 30 meters high. It tore through concrete mosques, flung fishing boats into hotel lobbies, and killed tens of thousands within the first 15 minutes. But the ocean wasn't done. The tsunami swept across the Indian Ocean at jetliner speeds, over 700 kilometers per hour, and struck Thailand, Sri Lanka, India, and even Somalia on the other side of the continent. In Thailand, beachgoers didn't even know a quake had happened. There was no shaking. 
just a sudden, unnatural retreat of the ocean. And then, minutes later, the first wall of water. In Sri Lanka, a packed passenger train was derailed and submerged, becoming the single deadliest rail disaster caused by a natural event. Over 1,700 people died inside it. Across 12 countries, over 230,000 lives were lost. Some bodies were never recovered, some cities never fully rebuilt, and some survivors carry memories they can't ever forget. Of loved ones gone, of entire landscapes changed. That's level 7. Level 8 is a line we haven't crossed in modern human history, or at least, not with cameras watching. But science says it can happen. And if it does, it wouldn't be a tragedy. It would be an extinction-level headline. We're talking about waves over 30 meters high, a 10-story building made of liquid, moving at jet speed. The force is beyond human comprehension. One cubic meter of seawater weighs a ton. Now multiply that by millions and hurl it forward like a battering ram. Not one wave, not even three. A train of them, relentless, sustained, unstoppable. At level eight, the term flood doesn't apply anymore. It's not about water entering homes or drowning vehicles. It's about coastal land being temporarily, if not permanently, returned to the ocean. Airports disappear, highways vanish, power grids collapse. Survivors, if there are any, are left in isolated islands of infrastructure, cut off from the world. And while we haven't yet seen a level 8 event, we've come terrifyingly close. The 1958 Lituya Bay mega tsunami in Alaska is often cited as the most extreme wave ever recorded by human instruments. 524 meters high, that's not a typo. That's taller than the Empire State Building. But here's the caveat, it wasn't oceanic. It was contained in a narrow fjord, triggered by a massive landslide, which funneled all the energy into a single wave up a mountainside. It wasn't the kind of tsunami that sweeps across oceans and hits populated coasts, but it showed us what's physically possible when enough mass shifts suddenly and violently. In ocean terms, a true level 8 would require something more massive than a standard earthquake, something like the collapse of an undersea volcano, a massive seafloor landslide, or perhaps the unzipping of a megathrust fault so long and deep it triggers a rupture cascade, the kind that cracks open 2,000 kilometers of crust, displacing entire slabs of the ocean floor. If that happened near, say, the Cascadia subduction zone, the consequences for the Pacific Northwest would be unimaginable. Cities like Seattle, Vancouver, and Portland would be hit within minutes, not just with one wave, but with a series of violent pulses, each one capable of tearing through the remains of the last. And Cascadia is overdue. Geological records show that massive tsunamis have hit the Oregon and Washington coasts roughly every 300 to 500 years. The last one? January 26, 1700, a full 325 years ago. We know it happened because Japanese coastal towns recorded an orphan tsunami that arrived without warning hours after a silent earthquake halfway across the ocean. It's the only written evidence of a level 8 shadow event in pre-industrial history. If it happens again, when it happens, it won't be remembered as a Pacific Northwest disaster. It'll be a world event. And yet, that's not the ceiling. Level 9 is where modern civilization breaks. This isn't a tall wave. This is a planetary system crash. To reach this level, you'd need a wave exceeding 50 meters with reach, duration, and force on a scale never before recorded in history. It's not localized, it's continental. The entire eastern seaboard of the US could be threatened. Major cities like New York, Miami, and Boston would be exposed. So would massive ports, oil refineries, nuclear facilities, and global internet hubs, all of which hug the coastlines by design. Peer-reviewed studies have modeled it. FEMA has considered it. And while scientists continue to debate the likelihood, the possibility is enough to haunt those who track such things. A tsunami of this magnitude would wipe out entire metro areas. Think of Lower Manhattan underwater. Wall Street submerged, the National Mall erased. Evacuation, even with warning, would be a nightmare. Millions of people jammed onto gridlocked roads, air traffic paralyzed, emergency systems overwhelmed. There's no drill for that, no high ground tall enough. And globally, the impact wouldn't be limited to the Atlantic. Ports would shut down, trade would freeze, global stock markets would tank, 
food supplies would destabilize, insurance markets would collapse. This wouldn't be a disaster you could recover from in a few years. It would alter the world's economy, population distribution, and geopolitical map. If level 8 humbles, level 9 shatters. But even that's not the end of the scale. There's one more level, level 10. This isn't a tsunami, it's a reset. There's only one known event that fits this level. The Chicxulub impact, 66 million years ago. A 10-kilometer-wide asteroid hit what's now Mexico. It triggered waves over 1,500 meters tall. Inland seas sloshed. Ocean water reached thousands of kilometers inland. Fossils found in North Dakota show ocean debris and fish with molten glass in their gills, clear evidence that something struck with unimaginable force. This was more than waves. It was a planetary vibration, seiches, shocks, rebounds, tsunamis that redefined coastlines and began an extinction event. Three quarters of life vanished, including the dinosaurs, not just from fire or ash, but because Earth systems collapsed. Level 10 is speculative, but real, not something we've lived through, but something the planet remembers. And if it happened once, it could again. If this shook you, imagine what else the planet's hiding. Subscribe for more.